All right, so here we go. We have a clip up. I've already gotten rid of uh, one of the blemishes that was on there. And I'm going to show you how to do another one that may have a problem uh, interacting with the collar. So this is the one we're going to work on getting rid of. This is DaVinci uh, 16 uh, Beta 3. What we do is we set up a, another node. Option S gets the node. And then we run down to, we turn over to our tracking. We make sure that it's on FX because we're going to be putting a, a, one of the OFX effects, which is a patch replacer, onto the node. And we need to track that first. So because blemishes generally are able to be tracked fairly easy, easily, uh, it's not too difficult to do. Now, because I'm not tracking a, a window, I don't need zoom, rotate, perspective, and everything else on here. This is a point tracker. So when I click on that at the bottom here, remember we turn it to FX, point tracker, we click this, and we get a little blue marker. If it doesn't show up, zoom back out, get the frame in there. It usually appears in the center of the screen. Drag that over to what you want tracked. Now, one of the main things that you want to do prior, and this is what I've already done well ahead of time, is you go through each clip and you find out, um, does it go completely off screen? Do I need another solution like Mocha Pro and things like that uh, to take care of? But no, this works really well because it didn't go off screen. It didn't change so uh, drastically. This is going to work. Again, all I need is pan and tilt. That just means it's a... X and Y uh, axes, and we've got it on clip. The effect patch replacer does not work with frame yet. Uh, frame means that on each individual frame that you want to change the track, uh, the patch replacer effect will also change automatically. The, that doesn't work. Hopefully that's something that they will take care of, but uh, there is a workaround for that. And it's a little cumbersome, but here we go. So we've got the track again. Option S, pull out the node. Turn your tracker to FX. It's on clip. Click to put a point tracker. Drag the tracker to what you want tracked. Hit the track forward and let it do its work. Now, uh, this specifically is blurred out uh, to some degree. And even blurred out, it, it manages to do a pretty darn, darn good job. Uh, generally, for blurred images and things like that, you have to pull out Mocha, and um, that will take care of that. But uh, <laughs> DaVinci has some actually wicked tracker. Uh, it would be nice if they could actually allow you to export the track data. That would be that would make it a superb program. So, going back and forth over this, you can see that it has indeed tracked. I've got a uh, external eight gig um, Radeon graphics card. So, uh, this is four K footage, uh, raw footage. Uh, it's uh, I've converted it into Apple Pro is four 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 because I've already color graded. Uh, generally, I won't color grade first um, before I do the effects, but I'm doing it this way so you can see a little better image. So in here, we've got this motion. Everything else is looking good. There's nothing that's drastically jumping. It doesn't take off. And again, I can just hit play and it'll go through it nice and slowly. It, it holds the track really well. So going back over to either the start or the end, scroll on down to Resolve, VF, uh, Resolve FX Revival, and you go to Patch Replacer, drag that onto the node you just created. Now you may have to zoom out, and that's perfectly okay. You place the one that has the uh, corner square markers on there uh, over, that's your target, over the actual target. And then you drag the other one because that's where your source is going to be uh, coming from. Scroll 
with the mouse in, click middle mouse and drag. And we get here, I'm going to go with, now, if I want to see what's actually tracking underneath, I will go up to here. And it's keep original detail. And uh, that allows me to see what is underneath. And that also allows me to see, as I scroll through, did anything uh, come off too far? Now, it specifically hits the collar here, and I'm going to leave that in so that you can I can show you how to deal with that. And otherwise, I would just uh, readjust the track. So this is hanging out, catching it just a bit. I'm going to put in just a little bit of a blur. Turn that off. We can just click back to our original one. You can see how well that makes everything disappear. And here is where we get the blue of the collar blending in with the skin tone. Now, uh, the rest of it holds uh, fairly well. Again, another blue. So this is for you humans. All right. The uh, thing about this is it would be really nice if you could go through here and, like I said, where the tracker is, to be able to go and click frame, move it to where you want, um, where it basically puts automatic keyframes each time, and this would follow that keyframe. But as soon as you do that, you hit frame, uh, this, uh, the patch replacer no longer is attached to the tracker. And they haven't replaced, they haven't fixed that just yet. So, and I'm hoping they do. So here's the workaround for it. So everywhere that I see it is coming into contact with the blue. Clearly, I could just go like this and shrink it down to where I wanted to. And I could also, this is another pet peeve of mine. <laughs> so. Sometimes you have to expand it really large in order to drag it over and then shrink it back down in order to get it. I could just go like that, and changing that would make take care of the problem. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a difficulty that you might encounter. So I'm going to place it back over that. And again, I'm going to look at my Keep Original. Everything seems to be pretty good in there, but it's bleeding into, into my skin tone. So, what I'm going to do is move closest to where it starts bleeding in. Just prior to, I'm going to set keyframes. So, I've got source X, source Y, target Y, target X, target Y, target width, and target height. Now, I'm going to click all of them because in the course of doing this, uh, sometimes you want to make fine-tune adjustments uh, as you're going along. And if you forget that you didn't place you know, the keyframe on the one you wanted to, then you've got to go back and do that. So now I'm going to scroll through and see where it fades out. So that's pretty good. It's already gone past my blue on the bleed, and then I will add another keyframe on each one of those. So what that does is it retains from that keyframe uh, to the end of the clip uh, the same settings. It's in the middle that I'm going to change. So the easy way to do that is to go back to the first keyframe. It's just to hit the arrow on any one of these, and that will drag you back to the first keyframe. Now in here, you can see this is where the bleed starts occurring. So what I'm going to do is shrink this a little bit. I didn't want to shrink it for the whole thing. Maybe I just wanted to shrink it just for this little troublesome part. So I'm going to look over here at target width or target height, and I'm going to change those. Da Vinci, if you drag in the numerical area, you get a little bit more precision. So that's all I'm going to do is shrink that a little bit, and then I'm going to shrink the target height a little bit. So now we'll go through it, 
and it has shrunk down in between. If I need to change that anymore, I will. But you can see that took care of it. So now because my keyframes are have been set around the troublesome area, I still have my original settings. The nice thing about this is as soon as you drag in the patch replacer, because you already tracked it with a point track, it automatically attaches to that point track, wherever you happen to set it. That means I could take this and I could drag it. <laughs> I'm going to mess up my drag here. But I could take this and drag it and set it here. And it will move on that track at that point, uh, even offset like that. That's actually pretty neat. I enjoy that. Uh, so just a couple of undos there, and we get back to where we were. Because there was another spot where it came in and started bleeding. Let's find that here. There it is. So again, I'm going to set keyframes before the event. And we're set there. And really, it's one of those things, it's like, okay, um, maybe I just decided, hey, I wanted to just change the target width and target height. And then you get in there and you start messing around with it, and then you go down later on, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, crap, you know, I wanted to change the source, uh, or I wanted to change the target uh, X and Y position. Always good, just turn them all on. <laughs> You're going to save yourself some trouble later on. And then I'm going to go to the end of the bleed section. And go right there. That's where I will also turn it back on. So we're going to see where it starts becoming troublesome. Right about in there. That's a big line. So target width, I'm going to change because now anything I do to that width and the height uh, will affect uh, what is being copied from this position to here. Now, I can also take and change the source, I mean, uh, any one of these, because I did put the keyframes on. If I go to the target um, X position, uh, it will also, uh, yeah, it's taking some of that at the end there. Take a look at that. So I'll go up a little bit, target Y. I'll go a little wider with my width, because I want to include that piece over there. Okay. Now, because of how this looks, I can see that I'm going to want to add a little bit more feathering. And... And it's not only that. Sometimes you're looking at this and it looks like you need the feathering, but what you really need to do is change the position of where the source is coming from. Because uh, you can see that curve. Uh, it starts bleeding into the shadows under here, and that's going to be picked up uh, there. So because I also have all of my keyframes on, I can also change this to a different position. And you can see that took care of uh, the color disc um, the discoloration so the main thing here is we're looking for that bleed and I'll just turn that off so we can and again I just do that by clicking on my any of the other nodes as long as they're not you know tracker nodes and things where those get in the way and there's a little more of a problem so let's take a look at that and that you can see is bleeding right into it and yes, I can click and drag and pull that over, and it'll record those actions. I can shrink it down. Uh, I do like the numerical precision, so uh, feel free to drag and put it wherever you wish, or to shrink it and adjust it however you wish by hand. And as long as you've got all the keyframes made, it's going to work for you well anyway. And I'm going to just go back to the first one. Uh, we got a little bit of that one showing yet. so. I am going to make this a little more obloid. There we go. And again, everything within the error zone was keyframed, so I'm good. And that's it. 
And the nice thing about this uh, versus Mocha, yeah, if you've worked Mocha Pro, when you're creating clean plates for Mocha Pro, especially because here, because I introduced grain uh, as part of the um, the look for this, uh, that's when I started working color grading. And because it's a live grain that uh, moves, um, Mocha Pro, when you create a clean plate, you, um, you save out a clean plate at one uh, particular period of time, and you make your, you make your adjustments on that frame, uh, then you save it out, and then it says use clean plates um, exclusively. Now, uh, if you don't do more than one clean plate, meaning if you leave it on that one clean plate and run the clip through, what it does is it keeps a static grain pattern that shows up. Um, that's why this actually takes live grain that's moving and applies live grain into this area, which is preferred. Mocha Pro, you can get away with it by doing a lot of clean plates throughout the clip. It's a little more troublesome, but sometimes with uh, certain tracking, uh, Mocha Pro can't be beat. Um, but in here, as you can see, this did a really good job. Uh, I already took care of another one under here and one here. So those are already done, and you can't tell. Uh, it, it's really, really a good job. So that is how you track and remove blemishes in DaVinci Resolve. 16 beta 3. Uh, what I'm going to do is tackle that one, and that'll be gone. And that's just a little something. I wanted to let you know uh, what I'm doing in the background and why it's taking me so long to get all this uh, <laughs> done. We finally got it shot. Uh, I finally got it all edited, and there's a lot of work going on, and now I'm finally getting this done. Uh, but I hope this helped you. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please thumbs up. And uh, we also have a Patreon channel. It's for my core JKD channel, but it also fuels what I'm doing here because um, my people who are all actors in every one of my short films are all my students. And there are a few of them here, uh, Manny, um, Ninja, and Om, uh, Anna Jano, she's an artist herself. They are also part of my crew, film crew. They've actually developed a really good uh, working rhythm with what I do. And so anything that you do on the Patreon channel, I'm going to be putting behind the scenes uh, work there as well. Um, and if you like some of the slow motion effects from some of the martial arts stuff, that's on there as well. But anything you do there will help fuel what I'm doing here so that I can actually help pay them uh, it's really something that I would like to do. Um, and as we start off new channels and things like that, it's always, <laughs> it's always a burden, but we ask, uh, we ask you if you can spare that dollar a month. Really, that would even help. But otherwise, if nothing else, please thumbs up and share this channel. And um, if you have comments and questions, please put it in the comments and area below. And thank you.